Okay, so today I'm going to be uh, preaching on the wise and foolish builders. Uh, I was just, uh, I just came across the situation with uh, Kent Hoven and I was just thinking about, you know, how, you know, people, they, they seem like they're doing a lot of work, but just at the end of the day, they just, you know, they don't have a good foundation and it's just a huge fall at the end of it. It's such a sad scenario if you guys haven't um, seen it. So anyways, I, uh, that's sort of why I came across this passage. I'm not really preaching about Ken Hovind today and, and all the stuff that happens in his life. But I am preaching today on just this passage because as I, was, I was reflecting on um, Matthew 7, 21 and the wise and foolish builders. I just thought, oh, what's some principles we can gather from it? And maybe it's a bit of a reminder and an encouragement for you guys to make sure that you are the wise man in this parable as opposed to the foolish man. Um, there's actually two places that this is uh, referred to in the Bible, in Matthew and in Luke. And there are some differences between them. I don't know if you've noticed, but we'll take a look at a bit of the differences and then we'll talk about a bit of applications of the wise and the foolish builder. So let's just start off by reading the two portions. So this is in Matthew 7, 21. It says here, not everyone, we'll just start reading from here, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So that's in Matthew 7. In Luke 6, this is how it goes. In Luke 6, 46, which is a parallel passage, Jesus says here, And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without, without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great." So those are the two passages. It's a very familiar parable, so I hope you learned something today because sometimes when Bible is a bit too familiar with us, we kind of switch off because we think we've already learned it all. But you, know, you can always learn different things don't, that you don't know. And, and one thought I was having, I was talking about this with Elizabeth, is you know, if you ever sit in church and you hear my preaching or you hear another preaching and you sit there thinking, oh, you know, I've heard it all, I already know this, you know, you hear the topic of the sermon and you're kind of like, I already know all this and you kind of switch off. That means that's the time for you to start teaching. You know, like the Bible talks about, this is the time when you ought to be teachers. Maybe you need somebody to teach you again, the fact that you're not stepping up in order to teach the things that you do know. So if you feel that, you know, you listen to my preaching, you say, I already know a lot of this stuff. Hey, it's time, especially for you guys, to, to step up and actually start teaching the things that you know. You know, get yourself to a situation where you are preparing sermons and doing that thing and actually sharing that knowledge and getting that practice so that we can do more. Because if you, hey, if you can prepare yourself, guys, to, to, to preach one day, we can plant other churches in Sydney, you know, and have at least congregations in different areas uh, rather than everybody having to travel here and you know even reaching certain areas because you know we will be doing the soul winning here but if we can grow to the point and have somebody else go out then we can do soul winning in in that area as well and have more independent churches so all that to say this is like you know hey there there are very familiar passages but hey i hope i hope you learned something today at least uh from this familiar passage but let's look at some of the differences first and then after we look at some differences we'll go into some applications of what we can learn from the wise and the foolish uh, builder. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, are you guys aware, because uh, a lot of you may not have grown up in sort of like you know, Baptist churches, 
Um, but do you know the, uh, um, the, the children's action song uh, for the wise man and the foolish man? Who knows the children's song of, you know, the way you can teach this? You don't know it? Really? Who's that? Yeah, you know it, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you used to sang it, sang it in Sunday school when you used to teach that. But um, I see. So you can actually teach this parable to children with a song, uh, and, and it's an action song. So I'll do it for you. This is how it goes, right? It goes, it goes. The wise man built his house upon the rock. You know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. So you guys haven't heard this one? I know you guys have. None of you guys? Okay. So, you can t so this is the foolish man. He goes, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the sand went crash or splat or whatever, you know, your children like. But, you know, action songs, I know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not really like a children's person, but I do know action songs are very good with children. It's like when you watch The Wiggles, right? Well, it was Kayla that was singing The Wiggles, you know? Like, The Wiggles, like, when, you know, when I look at The Wiggles, I'm just like, these guys are like the biggest idiots, you know, just like dancing or whatever. But children love that stuff, like, you know, just, that's why I wish I was that more that sort of person, because I'm sure my children would love it, right? But if you can learn these sort of action songs, like, these will stick with your children for ages, you know? I mean, I, I learned it when I was older, and I remember like all these action songs, you know, like deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide, all these different songs. So if you can learn these different songs, like uh, these, you can, you know, you can read this to them, you can sing that song, and make it a bit fun for them, and it'll stick with them for their life. So it's interesting that you guys know it's a very famous uh, children's song. So let's look at some differences. So when I look at differences, I like to kind of put it side by side like this in a table and then I can see when there's like different parables and you sort of line it up next to each other, you can see uh, differences between them and maybe learn why there are differences. You know, you know that there's this passage in Matthew and the passage is in Luke and you just sort of think, yeah, they're kind of the same thing and you don't really, you know, look into it a bit more. But when you actually compare them side by side, it's like, hey, why are these different? So let's just look at them first of all. There's just three differences I just want to point out. But see, in Matthew 7... You know, we have this wise man and this foolish man and we know that one built his house on rock and one built his house on sand. You know, Luke says he built it on the earth and basically this flood comes and then one, you know, stands and one doesn't, right? And we can learn some things from that. But what we can see in Matthew 7 is the, the application here is actually to salvation, isn't it? So we see one in Matthew because even though, even if we don't have Luke, we can kind of say, well, Matthew is about salvation, but you can kind of take the principle that our spiritual life also is like that too. Are we building our spiritual life on a rock? You know, is it stable? Is there a foundation? Or are we building our spiritual life on sand, right, in, in, this, in this parable? But that's what I think the difference is between Matthew and Luke. You know, because you see Matthew, right, and it starts off with, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. See, many will say to me in that day. So this parable in Matthew 7 is alluding to the salvation aspect of the wise and foolish man. Where Jesus is saying, hey, the wise man is the one that's saved, right? Because he's saying, hey, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the one that's the foolish man is the one that obviously goes to hell because he's not saved. So... What is the doing the will of Father in that parable? That's the believing on Jesus Christ, right? That's the, the obeying the gospel and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that. I've got that here in, um, I don't know if I have it down here somewhere, maybe a bit later uh, in my notes. 
So that's what I think is happening in Matthew 7. Matthew 7 is alluding to the salvation aspect. So salvation, you're either saved or you're not, in the sense that you either have your house on rock or you have your house on sand, you know, and that's the believing on Jesus Christ. If you've believed on Jesus Christ, you've done the will of the Father by you know, believing on Jesus Christ because that's something he wants us to do. If you believe, your house is on rock. And then when the flood comes, the floods come, your house is going to stand. So what does the floods represent in Matthew if it's to do with salvation? Well, that would represent God's wrath, wouldn't it? God's judgment comes, but then you are spared from God's judgment. It doesn't fall. So what can you learn from it? You can learn that, we, hey, we can't lose our salvation, right? Because once we build our house on rock, we're saved. When God's judgment comes, it doesn't fall, right? We, we're saved. We have eternal security. Whereas the person that builds their house on sand, they don't believe on Jesus Christ. They go to hell. The fall is great, you know, and it comes suddenly, right? Because once you die, you're just there immediately. So that's Matthew 7. We can see that Matthew 7 is alluding to salvation, right? Because Jesus is saying, hey, you know, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, what do I think Luke is alluding to? See, Luke, I believe, is referring to your spiritual life, right? Because it's not talking in verse 46 about, hey, whether you'll enter into the kingdom of heaven or not. Now the question is different, right? It's not people that were doing sort of the will of God in the sense that they were prophesying in Jesus' name, they were doing many wonderful works. The problem was that they, weren't, they were trusting those works to get to heaven, right? So they were doing the works. They went to Jesus saying, hey, Lord, Lord, and he's saying, hey, no, you actually are building your house on sand because even though you're doing works, you're trusting those works, you're not saved. But in Luke, he's saying, why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So this is a, a different perspective now, isn't it? Because the, there are people that are actually trying to do the work of God, but they're trusting that, right? And they're not saved. But now it's people that are calling him Lord, Lord, but they're not doing the things that he's saying. He's saying, hey, you call me Lord. It's like you're a believer why don't you do the things that I tell you to do? So you see how it's slightly different, isn't it? Even though it's the same parable and it's sort of alluding to the same thing. Now, I don't know. One thing I'm trying to work through in my Bible study is I want to try and do like a, um, a chronological gospel where you kind of like actually look at, you know, the events, what happened in Luke and try and line up the other gospels and see where things actually happen. Because when you do that, because you, you just assume when you read Matthew 7 and you re read Luke 6, you're probably just assuming, hey, was this the same sermon, the same time, the same location? Did he say it multiple times? That could be the case. Or it could be that he was preaching this at a totally another time. You know, he was preaching maybe the same location at a different time and it was a different sermon. So it's not always the same sermon that's being preached at the same time, I don't believe. Sometimes it is and maybe he's saying it different ways. But other times, it could be actually a different time where he's saying the same thing, uh, teaching similar things. So in Luke 46, says, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So I think there is a difference here. And obviously, this is, these are just my thoughts, you know, because it's not explicit in here that one is about salvation and one isn't. But I think what we can gather from here is the introduction to Matthew 7's parable is saying, hey, not everyone's going to heaven, but the introduction to Luke's parable is saying hey you're a christian but why aren't you doing what jesus has commanded of you so that's one difference i think is that one is alluding to salvation which is not by works you have your house on a rock or on sand is whether you believe on jesus but then there's also the your spiritual life the stability of your spiritual life is the more you actually do the things that Jesus says, you will have a more stable life, a more stable Christian life. And the people that don't, they're the ones that are getting out of church, hanging around the wrong people, going back into old sin, because you're not doing the things which are commanded of you. Because if you did, you would have a stable Christian life. You'd be in church, you'd be going soul winning, and you wouldn't be backslidden, you know, just um, in worldliness and whatnot. So you see, those are the two different aspects, salvation and then your spiritual life, which is, you know, we move from faith to faith. We have a faith to get saved, and then we have the faith that we live by day by day. There's one difference. Another difference I think is small, right, is, I don't know if you notice here, but when you go into the parable, I don't know if you notice this, um, he says here that, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, doeth them. 
I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods, right, plural, came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house. But see, in Luke, it says, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock, and when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. So I was just thinking, is there a reason why one is plural? You know, you've got, got one, you've got rain, right? One says the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. It's all like plural, right? Like it's like, it's like there's a lot of things happening, maybe at multiple times. Who knows? But the other one, it just seems like it's a single event. You know, it's just like he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. Maybe, maybe in both parables it's one event, but it seems like one is worse than the other. Like one is just like it's a flood that comes up and it's just beating against the house. But the other, it's like there's rain, there's wind, there's floods, plural. Um, so one thing I was just thinking is, well, because one is talking about salvation and one is talking about our life, it's almost like saying the person who builds their house on sand and they're not saved and they go to hell, that punishment is worse than anything that you'll experience as a trial, as a Christian, right? Because if this one is referring to our spiritual life, then the flood is like a trial that we go through and whether our spiritual life has stability. But then the one in Matthew 7, because it's referring to salvation, that one's worse. Like if somebody actually dies and goes to hell, hell is worse than anything that we will ever experience as a trial. And I want to show you here that floods in the Bible, obviously there's the flood of Noah, and I, that's what I wanted to show you here in Genesis, where a flood is actually used as an analogy, obviously, for God's judgment, but we also see that Satan has a flood as well. So in Genesis 6, we see, obviously, the flood of Noah's day. It says, Behold, I, even I, and this is God uh, talking here, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But look at here in Revelation 12, 15. It says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So you see here that God's judgment is analogous, obviously was a flood in the days of Noah and is analogous to a flood. But also the persecution that we receive from Satan is also analogous to a flood that's coming after the woman. So I think those, those parables can fit both, where, like I said, in the salvation one in Matthew 7, the flood that's coming is God's judgment. And if your house is on sand, then you face God's judgment and wrath and you end up in hell. But the spiritual stability is, hey, if your spiritual life is stable, you know, you put on the whole armor of God, right? You can withstand against the wiles of the devil because his wiles and his darts are like a flood as well that your house will stand against. So it's interesting that these are different. I don't know if you've noticed those and, and that might be some reasons why they are different. Now let's just talk about some applications. So obviously the, the parable is very familiar to us. You know, we want to be the wise man. We don't want to be the foolish man. So what are some applications that I've got? <clears throat> Now, let's just think about, first of all, that what is your house, right? Like when we think about the parable, your house is basically your life, isn't it? It's your, it's your spiritual life. But I think it's also the people that are under your care. So when we think about our salvation, obviously your salvation, if you are not even believing on Jesus Christ, then your, your spiritual life is at risk, right? It's going to go, you're going to go to hell instead of going to heaven. But let's focus more because, you know, all of us here, I believe, are saved. You know, if you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you better believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because otherwise you're the foolish man that built his house on the sand and then you're going to have to face God's judgment. But let's focus more on uh, us as Christians, right? Because we want to be reminded, hey, we want to make sure that we are building our house on the rock, that we have a, we, our spiritual life is stable. And how do we do that? So in Matthew, and you know, even if Matthew is about salvation, you know, we can use that same principle. In Matthew and in Luke, we know that our house is our life. So we're all building a house regardless, right? Because we're all living a life. It's just whether or not that house is going to build on something stable or whether it's going to be built on sand, something unstable. Now, I've always sort of pictured it as, and, and you know, people always sort of say, hey, well, you know, the rock is sort of like the foundation of God's word 
and then the sand kind of represents, you know, the opinions of man and false doctrine and things like that. Isn't that sort of how you heard it before? So, and I'm not saying that those don't apply. I think you could still sort of use the parable to that. But then what does the parable actually say, right? What is the rock? When you build your house on a rock, what does that rock represent? Right, it says here, Whoso, who, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. So it's not just that I know the truth. I, I know I, I'm, I'm in a great church. I'm hearing the truth. I'm hearing God's word. You know, I'm not in a Catholic church somewhere. I'm not a Muslim or a Mormon. I have false doctrine. I'm not some new age person. I've got the truth. That's, that's, not what, that's not when your house is on the rock. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, your house is on the rock. He's not just saying, hey, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, your house is on the rock. No, he's saying, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, that's the person that has his house on the rock. Right? So it's the person that hears the word and doesn't do it, their house is on the sand for the Christian, right? So it's not enough just to have right doctrine and just think, hey, my house is set, it's on the rock, right? Because I've got the truth. No, it's if you're actually doing the truth, then if you're actually doing what Jesus said, right? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, if you're not doing the things that Jesus says, that's when your house is on the sand. Does that make sense? Because so like, a lot of people think, hey, well, you know, I'm all set, right? I've got the right doctrine. You know, I'm going to church. But if you're not doing it, then your house is on the sand. So the rock is the person that hears and does the word. And that's what gives you stability, right? The sand is not somebody that has false doctrine. The sand is the Christian that has the right doctrine, but he's not doing it, right? Because he's hearing the sayings, right? He cometh to me, heareth my sayings. He, but look at this. Uh, we go further down. But he that heareth and doeth not. So they're there, they know, they're hearing God's word, right? But they're not doing it, right? The person that has the total wrong doctrine, I guess they would only apply in Matthew 7, whereas if they're believing that, they've got their house on another you know, sand and they're just going to go when, when God's judgment comes. So it's interesting that even this parable, and I understand that obviously it works with people that have the truth and don't have the truth in regards to salvation. We're talking about it in regards to your spiritual growth, right? Your spiritual life. It's not that the foundation is the truth, right? Because if we're in a church that's preaching the Bible, we have the truth, right? But just because you're in a church that has the truth, that doesn't mean your spiritual life is on a rock. The, the, the foundation of your house is your response to the truth. Whether or not when you hear the word, you actually go and do it. If you hear the word week after week and you don't do it, you are the foolish man that is building his house on sand. Right? You don't want to be the foolish man. You want to be the, the man, the wise man that built his house on the rock that hears the word and does it. So you see, you only have stability in your Christian life if you're actually obeying the word, right? So let's look at Romans, uh, let's go down here in Romans 10. This is why I've got this, right? Because when it comes to salvation, you say like, well, how am I obeying the word when salvation is not by works? Yeah, you're right. Salvation is not by works, but you're still obeying something, right? Because you have to obey the gospel. This is why the Bible says here in Romans 10, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, right? Because a command is kind of like to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If you disobey that, then you're not going to be saved. If you obey it, then you believe the gospel, you will be saved. For Isaiah saith, who hath believed our report? So you see how it's obeying the gospel is not doing works. Obeying the gospel is when you believe the report. You believe the record that God hath given of his son. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So even in the instance of salvation, you only get stability if you actually obey, right? You obey the gospel. But it's the same in the Christian life, right? You have to obey in order to get stability. Look here in 2 Peter 1.5. And beside this, giving all diligence, right? Add to your faith. So you see, it starts with faith. It starts with believing on Jesus Christ, but it doesn't stay there, right? Because if it just stays there, you're the foolish man that built his house on the sand. He says here, add to your faith, because as a believer, that's the first step, right? That's your found, that's your, you know, that's your start, you know, of where, what are you going to do as a Christian? So we want to add to your faith virtue, right? 
to virtue knowledge. So what, what is, you know, faith is the fact that you believe, virtue is the right and the wrong, and as you, as you, understand, as you add right and wrong, you start to learn more, you learn more knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. So temperance is when your faith is kind of tried a bit, right, to strengthen it, and it's tempered, if you think of it that way, the temperance. And to temperance, patience. You know, patience is when you go through hard times, like the patience of the saints, temperance, yeah, you know, oh, sorry, I said that to Terence. So temperance is when you keep on going, right? You keep going. Patience is when it's tried. To patience, godliness. So this is now that your behavior is actually lining up with Christ. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. So the way I see this, it's like, you know, you start actually living well as, you, you know, as you're growing in the faith and you start behaving godly, cutting the sin out of your life. And then the focus then stops being you, right? From godliness to brotherly kindness. Now you're actually loving your brothers and sisters in Christ and trying to be an encouragement to other people, helping other people to grow. And then to brotherly kindness, charity, which is that, I guess charity is like that sacrificial kind of giving of yourself to people that aren't even your brothers, right? When we think about soul winning and whatnot. whatnot. So you see how it starts with your faith, but, so you, but you're adding works to this faith. Right? And as you add it, you add it, you're adding these things to it. And look what it says here. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can have the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but if you're not abounding and adding to your faith, then you're not going to be fruitful. Right? You're going to be barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. So you're not thinking about the consequences of these actions when you're being a foolish man and just hearing the word, not doing it, thinking about the consequences it's going to have for not only your spiritual life, but if you have people under your care like children, people that look to you, the consequences it's going to have for them as well. And, and don't, don't forget as well, you're influencing the church, right? Because we all set an example here. The reason why a church has a godly atmosphere, a godly example, is because we are godly, right? And we set that atmosphere. Once we are not godly and we don't have that atmosphere, I mean, the church is not going to be like that anymore because we are the church. And I've forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So this is not saying to do this to make sure that you, to get your salvation. It's referring, like we said, in Luke 6, where you have salvation, but you don't have a stable spiritual life. You're going to get out of church and you're going to go back into sin. He's saying, hey, you want to make the fact that you're saved sure, meaning that it won't move. You know what I mean? Like you get saved, but you can get saved and get out of church, go back to the world. You know, be an enemy of God. You love the world. You don't love God enough. He's saying here, you know, you want to make your calling and election sure. So you, you're at, you know, like David said, I'm at God's right hand, I shall not be moved. For if you do these things, remember the doer of the word, ye shall never fall. Right? Remember the, the house that was on the sand, it fell and great was the fall of it. So, you know, I think that's why there's this, this distinction is different. This distinction is important. That it's not just the truth, it's how you respond to the truth. Because just because you're saved, it doesn't mean you're all set. You know what I mean? In terms of your spiritual life. Yes, you will go to heaven. You know, that's sure, right, in terms of your salvation. But your spiritual life doesn't mean it's sure if you're not doing the works. Now, another thought I had uh, when thinking about this parable, another application is we sort of picture in our mind in this parable, you, these two men, they build these houses, one's on a rock, one's on sand, and then all of a sudden, like the next day, it's like, it's, you know, when you watch like cartoons or something and there's always like these two parables, it's always like, as soon as they finish building it, it's like the next day the rain comes, right? And it's like, you, you build it. It's like the three little pigs, right? They've just finished building their house. And the next day, now it's tested. The wolf comes. And he's blowing and huffing and puffing the house. That's kind of how we think of it, right? But my thought was, you know what? If somebody built their house on sand, the flood may not have come the next day, right? It might have, months might have passed. Years might have passed that they're living in this house on sand. Right? And it's not being tested. Right? So what happens? They start to get comfortable, don't they? They start to think, you know what? I built this house on sand, but there's no problem. Because, you know, I've lived in here for a couple of years. I've lived in here three, four, five years. 
No problem, right? It's only once the flood comes that it mattered whether you built your house on rock or whether you built your house on sand. And the Christian life is like that, right? That's why you can deceive yourself into thinking, oh, I'm coming to church, I'm just hearing the word, hearing the word, I'm not doing the word, but my life is fine, right? Like you don't sort of see it instantly. You just think, you yeah, know, my kids are growing, they seem to be fine, you know, my business is doing well, my work's doing well, life is great, until some trials come, you know, and who knows what can happen. You know, a lot of bad things can happen when you just haven't laid that foundation, you know, in terms of your family falling apart or, you know, your children not living for God. Like, that would be a terrible fall, right? And you grow up, you raise these children, you think everything's fine, and you, you've been sending them to public school, and you just think, like, you know, everything's fine, they're just growing up. You know, but then when the floods come, when they're actually their faith is tried and you haven't set them up for that, they may fall and never come back to the faith because of what they've experienced or because you didn't prepare them for it. So I think of that as well in the parable, that it's not just like they set up this house and it just happens straight away. I think what can happen as well is you set up this house on sand, you know, you just get comfortable, you forget about the things of God, maybe you get away from church or maybe you just get comfortable just coming to church just hearing the preaching, just being a hearer of the word, and you get comfortable being, not, being a, not being a doer. Do you know what I mean? That sort, of hap that sort of happens in church, and that's why sometimes you need to hear sermons like this to make you uncomfortable not being a doer. You know, you're, you're uncomfortable. You're not in the soul winning. You know, soul winning numbers have dropped. People aren't going soul winning as consistently, and you get comfortable, right? You start thinking, hey, it's, it's fine. I haven't gone soul winning for months and months on end. Yeah, I just skipped church. I just haven't been for weeks and weeks on end. And you're fine with that. That's the foolish man building his house on sand, right? And one day you're just going to be out of church, never to return, you know, and, and what happens? That happens with a lot of people, where they just end up falling out and they never come back, you know, for many reasons. Maybe it's pride. You know, they get out. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to face people because they've been out for so long. Just those sort of things where the, the fall can be very big. And it's, you know, it's not always instantly obvious that you're building your house on sand. You know, and it's, it's not like if you live a godless life that you won't have pleasures to enjoy. You won't have a smooth life. You know, you can have a smooth life where, you know, everything's going fine financially, your job, your, your, you know, you've got a good relationship with your wife, you know, but, you know, you don't know what can happen if you've been building your house on sand when the flood eventually comes and you haven't got the stability. This is James 1.22. It's a very familiar passage. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So when I think about the parable of the wise and the foolish builders, it's like the foolish builder, he's deceiving himself into thinking that he's all good, you know, when he's not doing the word of God. He's just hearing it only. And yet, you know, he's built his house on sand. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now what's another application, right? Another application is, if you think about the house on rock, if you remember in Luke, it says he digged deep, right? He, he digged deep into the earth. So it's not that it didn't take any work. With salvation, yeah, it doesn't take any work. So sometimes when I think in Matthew 7, I wonder why in Matthew 7 it doesn't mention anything about the work that the wise man is doing. Right? You kind of just picture in your mind when you think a wise man built his house on rock and, and a foolish man built his house on sand. You just think there was a rock and there was sand, right? And then somebody built his house on rock and on sand. But what you learn in Luke is that the man that built his house on rock, he actually had to dig deep. So he had to actually dig past the earth and put in extra work to get to the rock. So it's almost like, you know, in order to be stable, it's that it represents that spiritual work that we have to do in order to have a stable spiritual house. So the house on rock, it takes hard work, right? It takes some perseverance, and it takes some foresight to think, hey, I want to make sure that I set up my spiritual life not to fail, looking forward, not just like the guy just think, hey, everything's fine now, but when rough times come, you know, I'm, my, my spiritual life is not going to hold up. So you need to think about this, right? You reap what you sow, you know, and, and think about, you know, what are you reaping not only for your spiritual life, but those of us who have family, you know, we need to start thinking about our children. What are we sowing 
for our children. You know, when we don't do the work of God, we're not setting the good example, if we're not teaching them and we are just sowing a, a, a sandy foundation for our house, what is going to happen when our children grow up and they get away from God, right? We haven't taught them, we haven't prepared them, we haven't instilled in them the right principles. One day, it'll be too late. When I think about this, I think about Proverbs 6, 6, you know, it says here, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Right? So we think about the wise man. He required some hard work. He was required to look forward um, in order to, to, to know and prepare for the hard times, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. So you see, the ant doesn't need somebody bugging them in order to do these things, right? They can already, they're wise about it. They can foresee what needs to be done. And even though they know that there might not be some immediate impact right now, they know it's going to give them the stability in the long run, right? Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long without sleep, O sluggard? When will thou arise out of thy sleep? See, when are you going to wake up to the fact that you can't just be a hearer of the word? You have to be a doer as well. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. So you see here that they're deceived into thinking everything's fine. Hey, just let things off a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But one day there's going to be a great fall that comes, uh, even in Proverbs 6. Now what are some other thoughts I have? Um, now one thing is that the fall is great, right? And it happens quickly. In, in, in Luke 6, it says immediately the house fall, fell and great was the fall of it. So uh, what I want you to think about is, you know, when you come to church, right? When you come to church and you hear the word preached, that is when you are hearing the word, right? I don't, you, you don't want to get into the frame of mind that, you know, I go to church once a week and I'm, I'm a doer of the word, right? You're not, do, you're not doing any word when you sit here listening to the word that's hearing the word right so when you come to church week after week after week you're hearing the word right so you might hear a sermon about hey you need to go soul winning right but if you if nothing changes in that week then you know i'm just hearing the word i'm not a doer of the word or you say you hear a sermon on how your relationship should be as a marriage and you go home and you do nothing about it it's just the same you're a hearer of the word so you're the foolish man building your house on the sand because you, you're hearing the word but you're not doing the word, right? Because you hear something from the word of God, but you don't change it, right? That's building your house on the sand. Well, let's say you hear a sermon about, uh, you hear preaching about how to raise your children. So let's say you, you hear a sermon about spanking your children or having higher standards for your children or preparing your children by teaching them proactively, not keeping them, them naive. You're a hearer of the word because you hear the Bible preached, but if you go home and do nothing about it, then you're building your house on sand. Right? You're not preparing your house on the right foundation, preparing them for the future, especially when it comes to our children. So, you know, whether it's you know, about our life or our ministry or our soul winning, you know, that's, that's when you're a doer of the work, is when you actually apply what you've learned. But church is not doing the work. You know, when you just come to church and you just hear the preaching, that's your opportunity to hear the word. But you then need to go and do it, right? And be a doer of the word and make sure that you're building your house on the rock. So there's a couple of things, a couple of examples in our life where I think we've seen it happen, right? We've seen it happen where people, you know, they haven't, they're not a doer of the work, they're not a doer of the word, and then their fall is great. And one is where people are not involved in church, right? It's the people that come week after week, you know, they're not really involved in church, they never get involved in the soul winning, they never get involved in helping at all, and we've already seen it in this church, where people come, they're excited, and then they're gone, and then they never come back again, right? Because I don't know what it is. It's just maybe that's what it is. When people fall, they fall hard, and it's hard for them to come back if they're not a doer of the work because they don't have that spiritual stability. So we've seen it happen all the time with people that are excited, they come to church, they don't have the foundation, and then they fall out, and it's always harder once you fall off to get back in. But another two examples I was thinking about, and, and, and one is, you know, in your marriage, right? If you have a marriage and you, you hear 
what the Bible says about marriage in terms of being a submissive wife or being a godly husband, being a good example, and you just hear it and hear it and hear it, and you're not a doer of the word, you don't actually apply it, and you're not keeping a good relationship, what happens with these relationships when they actually go through hard times, they're not on the same channel, it's been years and years where they don't really have a right goal, and then they have a conflict, and this is why, why divorces happen. They leave each other to the point where two people that used to love one another, used to be committed to one another, now they hate each other's guts. You know, that's what I think about the parable. Like they have this fall and great is the fall of it. And it's almost like this irreversible damage. And it's the same that happens with families. You know, families where you just don't take time with your children. You're not present. You know, you're not teaching your children. Maybe you're sending them to school somewhere. You're not really spending time with them. You think everything's fine. You're not taking heed to God's word and then one day you're, you realize, hey, your children are too far gone. They won't listen to you anymore. They believe something false and because we haven't given them the right foundation. And, you know, the reason why I was thinking about these things is obviously, you know, with, with Ken Hovind's situation, I just think it's so sad. But, you know, he, he's not the only one that this has happened to. Where you, you don't doubt that men like him, you know, men like Jack Hiles, where, you know, they were, you know, fervently doing spiritual work, but not where it mattered. You know what I mean? Like in terms of in their, in their family and in their marriage, you know, where you have Jack Hiles doing all this, you know, speaking engagements and all these events, but then, you know, he ends up committing adultery with his secretary or something like that. And then you have, you know, Ken Hovind doing all this great stuff. And then, you know, now he's divorced and then he married again and divorced again. And it's just, like I said, the, his great was a fall because, you know, even though we can do a lot of ministry work, you know, our most important work is, you know, making sure our spiritual life is stable and making sure the people that we are responsible for, like our wife and our children, that comes first, you know, to make sure that they are growing in the Lord. And what often happens with a lot of preachers is because they just get so busy, and it happens just in our day and day life too, where you just get so busy with work, you get so busy with just the things you want to do, that even though there's such a huge emphasis in the Bible on teaching your children, having a good relationship with your wife, these people have become hearers of the word and not doers when it comes to their house, right? Themselves and their family. And they just end up getting so busy that they are no longer keeping a good relationship. You know, they're traveling so much that they're not even with their family anymore. They hardly see their wife. They hardly see their kids. And then they wonder why their end is, you know, great is the fall of it, right? Like in the parable. So we want to make sure that we are not the foolish man, that we are building our house on the rock. And it's not just about having the right positions. I hope this is what you take away from this sermon, right? It's not just having the truth and being in a church, hearing the truth. If you want to have your house on the rock, you need to be doing the truth, right? You need to be, make sure that when you hear the word, you apply it. You hear a sermon about having a good relationship, having good marriage. You make sure you apply it in your marriage. You hear about teaching your children, making sure that they know the Bible, they understand the Bible, that you know the Bible so that you can teach it to them. That's when you're a doer of the word and that you're a good example to the church, right? That you go out, you preach the gospel, you know what you believe and that we're trying to get other people saved. Let's look at one more example in the scriptures and then we'll finish. But in Deuteronomy 5.22, says here, this, this is, I guess, the ultimate example, right? Of people hearing the word and not doing the word. And even in the New Testament, they are our example, right? It's an example for us. Deuteronomy 5.22, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire. So this is referring in Deuteronomy 5, right, just before they're going to go into the promised land. He's referring back to the time when they were in the wilderness, right, at the, the mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments and, you know, where they actually heard God speak out of the mountain. This is why Moses had to go up to, to get the commandments because the people were so fearful of God, they don't want to hear it directly from him. But in Exodus 20, I don't know if you know this, but the Ten Commandments, the reason why they were so unique is because they were actually the words that God actually spake out of the mountain and all of Israel actually heard those words. But then the rest of the commandments, they didn't want to hear. That's why Moses went up into the mount to get them. And this is what we, we learn about here. It says, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire 
of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice, and he, had, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. So I didn't put Deuteronomy 5, the beginning of the chapter, but the beginning of the chapter in Deuteronomy 5 is, is a repetition of the Ten Commandments, right? Which are in Exodus 20. Now look at this, verse 23. And it came to pass when ye heard the verse, voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire. So God actually descended on this mountain and burnt the top of the mountain, right, with fire. And they heard the voice, and it says, And God spake all these words, saying, You shall have no other God before me, and all these sorts of things. That ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. So you see, they've heard the word, right? They've heard it from God himself, God the Father out of heaven. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more. Then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. So he said, this is the covenant that they were making, right? They were saying, hey, when God tells us what to do, we will do it, right? And the Lord heard the voice of your words when ye spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever so you see here that they heard the voice of the lord they said hey we heard it and we will do it and he says oh i wish that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments because it would be well not just with them but also with their family right with their children so we ought to take heed to this too that when we hear god's word we want it to be well right with us and not just with us but with our children but if we don't do the commandments of god it might not be well with them right hey we have god's grace but, you know, we're not promised anything if we don't obey the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, we see here that this is our example, right? Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, right? So this is now Paul writing about that, you know, the, that group of people, the Israelites in the wilderness. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And all, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So even though I don't believe every Israelite back then was saved, they picture salvation, they picture saved people, right? Because they came out of bondage, they all drank of that spiritual rock, which was Christ. So they are a symbol of saved people in the New Testament. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Right, So they were punished of God. Now these things were our examples. See, so we look to this group to learn from them, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, so that we don't follow what they do and lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as, as, uh, as were some of them. Right, And the Bible even teaches us that you know, covetousness, which is idolatry, so we might not be bowing down to a statue. We not be, may not be worshipping a statue of a cow, but sometimes we become so covetousness that, covetous that our jobs become our idol, right? that we serve our job and we serve our, our, our um, materialism more than we serve God. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. So that would be like a young person hearing a sermon about being pure, you know, not going out and fornicating and not being a doer of the word, going out there and fornicating anyway. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also were tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, right, complaining, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the, de of the destroyer. Now, this is what I want to focus on. Now, all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. 
And look at this, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest ye fall. So again, going back to what are you building your house on? Are you building your house on the sand or are you building your house on the rock? And it's not just whether or not you have the right doctrine, right? Because these guys here, they heard the word of God out of God's own mouth himself, right? Out of the mountain, right? And they didn't do it. And God is saying here, hey, they are your example that you better take heed lest ye fall, right? You better take heed that you are building your house on the rock. And it's not just having the word of God. It's not just being a hearer of the word, but being a doer, you know, don't deceive your own self. So I hope that you learned something today about this parable, but, but more importantly, that you're reminded, hey, don't be a hearer only, but let's be doers of the word.